Well, good morning, church. We want to do something just a little bit different this morning as we start out. We want to do what we call a call to worship. Since we're doing a worship series, uh, we want to welcome God to this place. That seems kind of strange, doesn't it? You just, I mean, just from the buzz of the crowd, you were spending time welcoming each other, right? But do you, do you know that God wants us to be hospitable to Him? You know, it says in the Bible to enter His gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise so this morning we want to make a hospitable place to God so I'm going to say a prayer and uh, we're going to welcome God into this place as we worship so Father God we come before you now and we want you to know you are welcome in this place Jesus our Savior our King the one who blazed the trail for us Jesus it's all about you this morning you are welcome in this place. And Holy Spirit, our comforter, our peace, our guide, our teacher, the one who teaches us how to worship, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. May this spiritual family be hospitable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand as we begin. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise His name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all His angels praise proclaim, all His hosts together praise Him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise Him, O ye heaven of heaven, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise His gift, Jehovah, for His name alone is high, and His glory is exalted, and His glory And his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praise his give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Then forever he established his decree shall God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he 
hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. You may be seated. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. And I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. And I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on, a glorious light beyond all compare. And there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, We'll live to know you here on the earth, and I will fear no evil, for my God is with me, and if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go. Lord, you never let go of me. My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my soul
But anyway, as we look at this, and the first thing we think of is, I've got to find the answer. But that's not a question. That's a statement. Because what just has four letters, sometimes has nine, and never has five letters. So I brought that to your attention today to say, because in our world today, you have all this stuff on the Internet and the TV and all this stuff where they're trying to catch you doing something or trying to lead you into something. And communion, there's no question about communion. The statement is, he was crucified, he was buried, and he rose again. And that is the statement that we have. So as we take communion today, remember, there's no question about it. And I'm, I think about the uh, great... Oklahoma professor of common sense, Will Rogers, when he said, we don't need to learn a lot of new stuff. We just need to be reminded of what we already know. So in religion, that's what we need to do is just be reminded of what we already know. And our communion, we, we celebrate every week, but we celebrate the same thing, our risen Lord. So if you would, please make your way to the back if you don't have a communion uh, packet. And if you make your way to back, we will have our prayer. You are the words in the music. You are the song that I sing well. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords, you are the mighty God, you are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. Oh, you are the words in the music. You are the song that I sing well. You are the melody, you are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. Let's stand for this song before the sermon. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. O oh, holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing. Great are you, Lord, worthy of praise, holy and true, great are you, Lord, most holy Lord, just ladies. Good morning, church. How are you? 
We are glad you're here today. We're going to be continuing our series on worship this morning. Go ahead and be turning your Bibles to Psalms 29, and that's where we're going to be camped out at least a little bit this morning. And as you do that, we have another really good announcement, and uh, can I just say it's about time. Uh, Carl and Debbie McAfee, y'all stand up, and I can do that because they're family. And if the beautiful woman next to that uh, other guy, uh, you know, is, is, looks familiar, she is my older sister. They are placing membership this morning, Carl and Debbie McAfee. So, yeah, took you long enough, all right? <laughs> they actually live in, it's interesting, they live in Kennedale, but they spend most weekends here. They're going to be having a place down here as well, so you'll be seeing a lot more of them. So please welcome my family to our spiritual family this morning. So... Today, worship again. Today we're going to be in the book of Psalms. Anybody else like Psalms? And you like your daily reading or whatever. Sometimes you do Psalms and Proverbs and those kinds of things. You know, Psalms is the songbook of the Old Testament, but not just of the New Testament. In Ephesians and in Colossians, the New Testament church is commanded to sing to one another in the Psalms. And so it was not only something that has been done for thousands of years before Jesus, it was something that the New Testament Christians, it was their hymnal. It was their songbook as well that they would sing through. And, and what I love about Psalms, about half of them are written by King David and the other by different people in his court and different people throughout time, is that it seems like there's a psalm for every situation in life. Because if you read through the Psalms, anybody done that? They're not all just, yay, chipper, everything's great in life. A lot of those Psalms, a lot of those songs are laments. God, I don't know. It's really rough right now. I don't know how you're going to come through, but I still believe in you anyway. That's why I love the Psalms. Something for every condition, every situation. I guarantee you, this, this ancient songbook of the people of God has something that you can sing in your heart language with what's going on in your life. See, this morning we're going we're gonna to turn our minds beyond ourselves, and we're just going to focus on the glory of God this morning. You see, all through the Bible, there is this repeated phrase, especially in the Old Testament when it says, Ascribe God the glory due his name. It's almost as if, it's, it's like at the end of the week, if you work really hard for, you know, five or six days or whatever, there is a, a paycheck that is due to you because of the work that you've accomplished, the work that you've finished. It's the same thing because of who God is and because of what he has done we have an obligation. There is something due him from us. And it's to bring glory in worship to his name. So this morning, we're in Psalms chapter 29. I love this psalm. Especially after a night last, like last night when you're woken up to some stuff going on outside. This is my go-to psalm. For nights of thunderstorms and, and nights of um, even inclement or even dangerous weather, I go to this psalm, okay? And my wife can tell you, okay, we'll be sitting in the living room and there will be a, a flash of lightning and a clap of thunder that would shake our house. And many times I just go, yeah! And she'd go, you are so crazy. But it's because of this psalm. <laughs> It's why I do that. So this is where we're going to go to learn about how do we in worship glorify God. Give the glory due his name. Psalms 29. Let's stand for the reading of the word. Psalms 29. We're going to read the whole thing. Not too long. Here we go. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Oh, the voice of the Lord, it's over the waters. The God 
of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oats and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, we all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Have a seat. Oh, it's fun, isn't it? But do you sense the whole context? Just to give you a little outline of, of Psalms 29, it starts off with what? A mere mortal commanding heavenly beings to ascribe glory to God because he's due it. Just as it, is it this realm, this seen realm, this natural realm, we are called to we are due to give glory to God but so is this unseen realm and all the beings in it we come together to give glory to God but it goes on from God getting glory to the power of God displayed but then it ends what actually God giving glory to us and that's the that's the theme. That's the outline of this psalm. Just so you know, the word glory in the original language just means weight. It's just what's the weightiest thing in your life? What in your life weighs more than anything else? And whatever that thing or that person or that being is that weighs more than anything in your life, that's what you ascribe glory to. Do you know what the word wor worship means in the Old Testament? The Hebrew word for worship means to bow down. So get the picture. You get a glimpse of the glory of God. His weight, his majesty. And what do you do in response under that weight? You bow down. That's worship. And so this morning... I pray by the end of this lesson, we will learn even more so how to ascribe glory that's due our God because of what, who he is and what he's done. There was a, um, a mentor that I had in my life that challenged me with something that I still hold to this, to this day. He said, Billy, pick an adjective or a descriptive word that you're only going to use for God alone and don't use it for anyone else or any other situation. So I went through my vocabulary and, and I began to, I say awesome a lot. Oh, that's awesome. You know, that's cool. I also say dude a lot. That's why I say awesome a lot. It's kind of my, my uh, generation X. This is something we did. All right. But I felt this weight on my life that there's really only one. That's awesome. There's only truly one that I should be completely and totally in awe of, both who he is and what he's done. So in my life, even though I, I, I even messed up this morning, I caught myself this morning, I have tried to make the word all and awesome holy in my vocabulary and completely dedicated to God and to God alone. And, and that's just one way that in my life, in my vocabulary, I try to give God the glory due his name. And I, would, and I would just put that challenge for anyone that would like to join me in that. Pick a word that only belongs to God and separate that word out from your vocabulary and make it holy unto him. So this morning we're going to talk about glorified worship. And we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about glorified fear. First, 
That sounds exciting, doesn't it? Glorified fear, and then we're going to talk about the glorified exchange that happens in worship. Glorified fear. Do you see this, this language in Psalms um, chapter 29? I mean, this is pretty intense stuff. As you're looking at it, you, did you see an earthquake as we read it? Did you see the tornado stripping the trees and making the forest bare? There's only one phenomenon that does that, right? It's a tornado. So you have earthquakes, you have tornado, you have severe thunderstorms, you have all of these things that would make someone actually respond in a level of fear. Now, just to look at this a little bit, it, um, it talks about um, shaking the desert of Kadesh. And if you know anything about geography in Israel, that's the lowest part of Israel. That's where the really desolate desert is. It's also where the children of God wandered. The actual place of Kadesh is where the, uh, the nation of Israel was when they sent the spies across the Jordan to spy out the land. You remember that? And how only two spies came back saying, hey, it's big. It's beautiful, but man, there's big and bad people in there. And only two said, yeah, let's go take it. And the other said, no, we don't have enough faith. That's the place where that happened. Kadesh, the deserts of Kadesh. And God says, I will shake the deserts of Kadesh. But then it talks about the cedars of Lebanon. And it also talks about this place called Sirion. Sirion is actually Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is the tallest most elevated place, and it's all the way to the northern side of Israel. And so is Lebanon as well, and the cedars that it's talked about there. So in other words, from top to bottom, we all better fear the Lord. From the top of us to the bottom of us, we all got to fear the Lord. But I also think it's interesting that when it talks about the unbelief that happened in the deserts of Kadesh, it talks about shaking. Hebrews also talks about this. It talks about the sin of unbelief, and it actually talks about that story. And it says that Jesus is going to shake everything that can be shaken, so only that which is eternal remains. Somebody, anybody else feel like they've been through that shaking in your life a little bit? Where everything got shaken off, except the only thing that was left was eternal, right? That's what he does with unbelief. That's what he does with his people when we lack faith. He allows us to be shaken so we will come to our senses about who he is and believe. But up north, it's a different story. He's actually breaking stuff up north. He's taking big old cedars and he's breaking them in two. He's twisting them through tornadoes. He's actually making a mountain jump up and down. It's a little bit more violent. Do you know in the northern hemisphere of Israel, that's where all the Canaanite gods were? And the further north you went into Israel, it was more of a sign of you going into the place where foreign gods, other than the one true God, actually flourishes and lives. And you see the power of God, not just shaking and disciplining his people, but breaking and overcoming the enemies of God. God ain't playing God ain't playing. And God in his very nature is to be feared. But wait a minute, Billy. Doesn't the New Testament tell us not to fear? Absolutely. Isn't throughout the Bible, even in the Old Testament, how many times, it's, it's astounding, how many times you hear in the Bible, in the biblical narrative, do not be afraid. And yet, there are tons of verses in the Bible that say stuff like, the fear of God is the beginning of your wisdom. That you must fear God. So there is, in the Bible, a holy fear and an unholy fear. And we need to distinguish between the two. Because that holy fear, we need to bring more and more into our worship time. Hold on a second here. I'm moving around a little bit. Okay, maybe that fixed it. Okay, so let's talk about first this holy fear. I'm going to call it the fear in all. 
Psalms chapter 65, verse 8 says this, The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. Look at the comparison between the beginning and the end. To be in awe of something is to be overwhelmed by its magnificence. To be overwhelmed by the, by the height and the, the depth of something. Okay, um, one of the best places that we get a picture of this is the first time you saw the ocean. Do you remember that day? And everyone who sees the ocean for the first time has the same response. You were overwhelmed with the enormity, the weight, the glory of the ocean. The first time that you went to Colorado and you saw the mountains, for the first time, do you remember that? And how you were overwhelmed with the majesty and the, and the power and the, the height of the mountains. That's all. But now imagine that that mountain or that water is coming towards you. That mountain is actually moving towards you. Maybe the water's coming like a tsunami wall at you. You go from awe to what? Fear. And rightly so. So when we picture God the way he really is in his breath and his enormity and the fact that he's actually coming toward us, you're getting a taste of how we are to awe and be fear of God. And it's a holy fear that we have of him. Listen to me. Not scared, but in awe. Not Scared, even though that tsunami is coming toward us, even though that mountain is coming toward us, the normity of God, we're in awe, but we are not scared. Why is that? Because there is an unholy fear, and that unholy fear is the fear of punishment. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, listen to this verse and, and read it very closely. There is no fear in love because perfect love drives out fear. Probably talking about the unholy fear, right? So what's the unholy fear? Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Go back to our passage. Who did God discipline? And who did he punish? He disciplined his people. He punished the enemies. Do you see the difference between the two? Listen to me. Jesus didn't die so that you would fear being punished by God. He didn't die and make a way for you so that every time you go into the presence of God, you are completely guilt-ridden. You're completely covered in shame. And I know you did bad stuff, right? Okay, you did. And your father's going to deal with that. And your father's going to discipline you because of that. But he's not going to punish you like an en enemy because, listen, you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you know what Hebrews says because of that? Because of the blood of Jesus we have a confidence to enter into the most holy place with God. So when we see that mountain rushing toward us, when we see that tsunami of his presence making its way to land and headed straight for us, you know what scared people do? They run because they're scared they're going to be punished. Do you know what the sons and daughters do? They run to their father. Their father who is the God of all, but is still their father and who is so quick to forgive and is so quick to shower us in mercy, to pick us up back on our feet and to call us to be who we're supposed to be. We run to God, not away from God. A holy fear versus an unholy fear and how our churches have been filled for too long with the wrong kind of fear. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the nature and the character of my father. 
even though he should be revered, even though he should be left in awe, that we're always cowering like we're going to be punished. It dishonors the cross. And what Jesus did to cleanse you of your guilty conscience so that you could walk boldly toward the thing that actually could, the presence of God, kill you. But he's your father. Do you, do you see the tension here? The tension between intimacy with God as your father and reverence to him as the almighty God. You ever felt that in your life? I have. That this overwhelming feeling of intimacy with God, yet this almost, yes, holy fear and reverence of who he actually is. But you see, I think in the kingdom of God, intimacy with God and the holy fear of God are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they depend upon each other. Look at this verse, Psalms chapter 25, verse 14. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation for this one. The Lord is a what? Friend to those who what? Wow. The Lord is a friend. Are you a friend of God? I mean, not just a servant of God, not just a disciple of God, not even just a son or daughter of God. Are you close enough to God to call him your friend? According to Bi the Bible, those spots are reserved for the people who fear him. Because the people who actually understand the holy fear of God can have a friendship conversation with God that others cannot. He can talk to you like a friend because you understand who he is. And you understand what holy fear is. And by the way, I'm going to say this. If the holy fear of God is in you, you have to fear nothing else. Because you fear that which you yield to. You fear that which you believe is so much bigger than you. And if the fear of God is in you, there is no reason to be afraid of anything else that this world can throw at you. The worst heartaches of this world aren't to be feared. If you truly, truly fear God. And this tension of intimacy and reverence and intimacy and reverence you are to live in that holy tension because the tension between those two things is going to make you a worshiper who worships him in spirit and in truth by the way reverence to god and worship has absolutely nothing to do with your comfort can i say that again reverence to God in worship has nothing to do with your comfort and everything to do with his holiness. How many times, well, they're just being irreverent. Uh, I don't think that's very reverent. Nine times out of ten when I hear that come out of somebody's mouth has way more to do with what they're comfortable with as opposed to the holiness of God and the glory that's actually due his name. Whatever you fear most, you will worship most. Whatever you fear most, you will worship most. Fear yields to whatever is greater. I'm going to tell you every time, every time I've had an experience with God where his awesomeness and his glory was manifested to me. Can I be honest with you? In my quiet time, I thought I could die. I remember one time I was, I was in a, um, my prayer closet and I had a frustrating day. And it was back when I was doing ministry before. And I was so frustrated. I was so angry. I was so fed up with people. Church would be great, but, you know, it's full of people, you know. And I was whining and whining and whining to God about it. And, and I felt like God just let me go on and on and on. 
till he'd had enough. And I, I sensed, and I hear God from the depths of my spirit, like many of you do, right? It wasn't an audible voice. And I heard, son, that's enough. You ever heard that from your dad before? Son, that's enough. I can't explain what happened next. All I know is I had to get as low as I possibly could because of the weight of the glory that was in that room. And my nose was on the carpet. And I thought if I lift my head and look to see what's around me, I will die. Sounds fun. Hey, sign up. Anybody want that? I wouldn't trade it for the world. There's no better place to be than in the glory of your father. And he, did he punish me that night? No, but he disciplined me that night for my own benefit. And then after a while, he lifted. I, don't, I, can't, I can't explain it. It's like I, I felt like I'm going to stay here the rest of my life. I'm not getting up, right? And I can't tell you what happened other than I felt like the presence of God lifted me up like, a, like you would a child. You, you lift them up off the floor and say, hey, look at me. You remember Job when Job got, and if there's any person that ever deserved to whine, wouldn't it have been Job? Remember that story? I mean, he, went, he was like a rock star through most of it, and he finally went, God, are you kidding me? That's enough. And then God said, oh, let's have a conversation. Where were you, Job? You remember the story? <laughs> Where were you, Job, when I'm, oh, surely you were there when I made everything. Surely you have all understanding. And Job's like, okay, okay, I'll stop. He said, no, 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 you're going to face me like a man. I mean, it was kind of that moment. But don't you know of all the things that happened to Job, do you think he would trade that moment with God for anything? Because when I got up off that floor that day, I was different. The peace that I had after that, I can't explain to you. I felt clean. I felt pure. I felt right with my father in a whole new way. And it was him showing me, don't forget who I am, boy, and who you're talking to. It put God in his place and me in mine. And you'll never find the peace that you're looking for until that moment happens for you. Glorified fear, not unholy fear that has to do with punishment. You're a Christian, the blood of Jesus has covered you. But the holy fear says, yes, you're my father, but you are the God of the cosmos and I will give you the reverence to your name. And the glory do your name even if it makes me uncomfortable. But there's also a glorified exchange that happens here. Do you remember at the first of Psalms 29, it's about us and these heavenly beings, both realms ascribing glory <coughs> to God that's due his name. But at the end, who's doing the giving at the end of Psalms 29? What does it say here? Psalms 29, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with strength. Can you see the exchange? Us giving glory to God and then Him giving us stuff back. There, read this whole exchange in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And we all, let's watch the exchange here. And we all with unveiled faces. The fact that we can look upon the glory of God and not die testifies to the blood of Jesus and what it's done for us. And we all with unveiled faces, what are we doing here? We're contemplating, just like we're doing this morning, right? We're contemplating the Lord's glory. And by contemplating the Lord's glory, what's happening to us? We're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, just to specify the part of the Lord who is the Spirit. And so there's this incredible glory exchange that's going on with you and God during worship. You're coming 
That's what we talked about. Worship is an offering. You don't come empty-handed to worship God. So you're coming not empty-handed to worship, and you're giving God all that you are, all your goodness, all your victories, all your celebrations, all your heartaches, all your defeats, all your pains. Remember the, the sermon we talked about on offering. You're completely emptying yourself out to God in worship, in an offering. You don't come to worship empty-handed, but here's the truth of today. You don't leave worship empty-handed because God will fill you up. You will walk away with, with, with something. And according to this verse, what are you going to walk away with? You're going to walk away with strength and peace. When God humbled me nose to the floor... That night, when I was having my pity party, all I can tell you is when he lifted me up, I felt stronger than I ever had in my life. I felt a strength in me that I knew wasn't, well, me. It was him. And the overwhelming peace that I had from being humbled by God. What does it say in James chapter 4, verse 10? It says this. You know, some of you can quote this verse, or you can sing this verse, some of you, right? Humble yourselves before God, and what will happen? He will. Okay, son, you needed that perspective. You needed your nose to the floor moment. I ain't going to leave you there, though. Why? Because you're my son. And he lifts you up. And then he puts you where he wants you instead of you putting yourself where you want to be. And there's a strength that comes from knowing you're not the source of strength. He is. And if it takes you a nose to the floor moment to get that, I pray that happens in your life sooner than later. And then you walk around in his strength. God is the source of true strength. So humility is the only path to strength in your life. And it comes from being exposed to this awe-inspiring glory of God. So glorification gives us strength and glorification gives us peace. How many people want peace? This is the way you get it. By the way, side note, that leads to my Wednesday night class coming up this Wednesday night. Peace is not a state of mind. Peace is a person. And his name is the Holy Spirit. And if you're just positioning yourself to have a peaceful state of mind, instead of engaging the one relationship that can actually bring you peace because he is peace, you'll keep going in circles and circles and circles, looking for that which you can never get your hand on. But glorification gives us peace. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Worship language, right? Then they have to look like rejoicing here, rejoicing throughout your life, but, but, but still, worship language. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Stop right the next statement. The Lord is near. That changes everything. That's, that, to me, when I see that, that's a nose to the fore moment. And because of that, I don't have to be anxious about anything. I've been in the presence of the glory of God. What can this world do to me? I've been in the presence of the glory of God and I lived. That tells you how powerful the cross is that I didn't die. All right? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. It doesn't make sense. Your circumstances haven't changed Things aren't better in your bank account. Things aren't better in your physical body. Things aren't better in that relationship. 
The peace of God which transcends your understanding, your circumstance, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How do you get that? Experiencing the glory. Experiencing the glory of God. If you're not walking away this morning feeling stronger and more at peace, I'm not sure you worshiped. Is that fair? If you're not walking away this morning, I'm not saying it's but a little bit stronger and with a little bit more peace, I'm not sure you experienced the glory like he wanted you to experience the glory today, but not only today, every day of your life. A rejoicing, worshipful lifestyle is your path to peace. So, will we, Eastern Hills, will we ascribe the glory that we're due? That is due His name. Will we give Him what He deserves? You're glorious. And whatever gl glory that you've put on my life, by spending time with you, I'm going to give that glory back to you. I'm not going to hold on to it. I'm not going to hold on to the glory. Because he's going to give you glory. Don't hold on to it. You know what happens if you hold on to it, don't you? Pride. And then he opposes you instead of lifts you up. So he's going to show you how glorious you really are because you're made in his image. Our job is that when we have glory to give, we give it back to him. The glory do his name. Will we do that? The word glory means what? Y'all remember? Test time again, all right, from the beginning of the lesson. The word glory means wait. Worship means what? It means this. Now listen to me. One of the points of this series is that we will have freedom in our worship. That's the point. So by doing what I'm about to do, I want to make sure you have freedom. You have freedom to do what I'm inviting you to do, and you have freedom not to. All right? That's what we want. But I don't know another way. I don't know another way for us as a group of people in a spiritual family to ascribe the glory do his name except to sense the weight of his presence in this room and to respond by kneeling. So here's the deal. I'm going to ask you in a minute if you would like to participate. Some of you, I know, aren't dressed for it. Some of you physically can't get on your knees. Do you know that? Don't do it. <laughs> if you can't physically do it, don't do it. <laughs> All right, please. And so, you know, for those that can't, you maybe just, you know, put your elbows on your knees and just bow your head in reverence to God. But there is something about taking a knee before him. And then what we're going to do, and Barrett, why don't you come on and join me up here if you don't mind, brother. What we're going to do is, is I'm going to pray from this position, okay? And if you want to join me, great. If you don't, it's okay. It's okay, all right? And see if it changes worship for you a little bit. And then we're going to go, after I get done praying, we're going to go right into the song. And I'm going to ask you for whatever posture you've chosen, stay in that posture. Don't stand up yet. Just stay in that posture of ascribing him glory to his name. There will be an obvious place in the song when it literally says, I stand in all of you. <laughs> so there's your cue, right? <laughs> right? And then at that point, I want you to sense God going, okay, you've humbled yourself. Now let me lift you up. Don't lift your, just envision God lifting you up because you're his son and your daughter. And see if you don't walk away here with more strength and more peace than you walked in here with, okay? So those who would like to join, you can join me now if you're physically able.
God, we come before you now. And we acknowledge your glory. You are God, and we are not. You are God, and we are not. Jesus, this is your church. It's not any of ours. Holy Spirit, you're the only one who can teach us the heart of God. We humble ourselves as a spiritual family before you, just in a feeble attempt to ascribe the glory to your name. Thank you, God, for all that you are and all that you've done in our lives. You are the only one that is worthy. You are the only one that's awesome. You're the only one we will kneel to. Because you're the only one who gets our worship. And now as we humble ourselves before you, in due time, lift us up. And God, after we get done singing, there'll be people at these prayer stations. If somebody wants to pray more about this, I pray you give them the courage, even after the closing prayer, to go get the prayer that's needed. But Lord, right now, we together humble ourselves. Only you will lift us up in Jesus' name. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due. I stand in awe of you, and I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in.